Hello, I'm Christine Storry. I'm the Project Manager for the Partners in Procurement Energy Network. This network is part of the SBP regions and we represent the southwest of England. This module is one of a suite of modules for, for this project and it's looking at life cycle costing, which some people have a little bit of difficulty getting to the grasp of the concept of. However, we're not looking at tools in this particular module, we're just looking at an overview to give you a flavour. And on the SBP site, there will actually be more information and directions to, to more tools and, and, and how to, to access them and how to access help. As this is part of a suite of sustainable procurement modules, I'll do a quick recap of sustainable procurement. So sustainable procurement looks at the social, economic and environmental issues and how they can be worked within a uh, procurement context to actually provide a greater amount of benefit from that contract apart from just the spend. Looking at workers' rights local and, and globally, contribution to local economic development, employment, and how we can mitigate things like air, bad air quality with low emitting vehicles. It needs to work within the envelope of rules and regulations. Obviously the overarching one is the EU Procurement Directive for 2014, but your organisation will have its own rules and regulations as well, and their own policies, and each one will, will actually have a different one. It must also fit in with your organisation's purchase and organisational needs. And each, again, each one of those will be different for each organisation. Direct life cycle costing is the commonest form of life cycle costing, and it comes up in Article 68 of the, of the Procurement Directive, so please do go and have a look. It is actually quite clear. And this part of costing, it looks at costs beyond just the acquisition costs. So it looks at costs relating to acquisition, costs of use of consumption, such as energy and resources, and I'll give a few more examples in a moment, maintenance costs and the end of life cycle costs such as recycling or collection. And the reason why they're so important is the acquisition costs maybe look very favourable, but actually the running costs then may be very, very expensive. So your contract at the end of the three, four, five year period can actually be a lot more, double, triple than what you expected right at the start. Life cycle costing is also really important where you've got more than one team involved. You might have a team who has the budget for the acquisition and another team which has the budget for the running and the ongoing maintenance of it. And they need to work together to make sure that actually what they're doing and getting the right costing through is actually the right way forward for the organisation. So examples of costs that can be taken into account. Obviously the purchase price and the leasing costs. Do you need extra staff to operate the machinery or the equipment? Or does training need to be required and how many people need to be trained? That will have a cost implication as well. For things like MFDs, multifunctional devices, do you have to buy your own toner? Do, how are you going to dispose, dispose of your old cartridges? And are they going to be recycled or just going to landfill? How is that going to work? And how are they going to be ordered and is there a cost involved? Maintenance costs and requirements increase as a product gets older, obviously, along with spare parts. Again, are those costs included in the contract? Are they ongoing? And actually, how much will they be? And finally, at the end of the contract, what are your end-of-life costs? Is that product going directly back to, to where it came from? Or if it becomes an asset of the organisation, there actually can be a positive value in, in the resale value of that. It also might be a negative one if you're then paying for someone to take it away. So all these things work into life cycle costing uh, for, the, for the simplest model. Under the EU, there's a kind of LCC direct plus externalities. And this is a lot more complicated and takes a lot more expertise to do. And as such, not many people actually get involved in it, but worth having a look at anyway. It's where mitigation of environmental issues it incurs its own cost, but it can be, needs to be monet monetarily um, verifiable and determinable. Hence the difference in, in, in um, com complexity of actually putting these two together. Worth having a look at, but again, nothing to get too hung up about unless you've got some particularly highly emitting piece of equipment you're using. Mandatory common methods. Again, under that particular article, it says if there is a mandatory common method in use, then that must be used. Oddly enough, though, there's only one um, specified <laughs> across the board in this area, and that comes under the Clean Vehicles Directive around low emission vehicles and clean emitting vehicles. I suspect this clause was put in, in the, maybe at some later date there might be some LCC methodology which does become mandatory across the board, in which case they already have this clause in there to say everyone must use that. But at the moment it's only around clean, clean vehicles. Why is life cycle costing so important? And it truly is very important. It encourages the analysis of business requirements at the start of the programme. 
if you don't know what you need, how can you actually identify what the cost will be across the length of the contract? Do you know what you're actually asking for? And are there going to be nice, nasty surprises? It makes better informed decisions. If you use it to inform the specification or your option route, then obviously having those costings up front and being able to compare them early on is really important. As a result, you get more robust contracts. You know what's happening and you know what's coming up. And both the contractor, the supplier, and the organisation knows exactly where their commitments are. It is allowed for in the 2014 directive, so use it if it actually makes sense. It makes really good financial and procurement sense to do so, particularly when life cycle costing can save a, a quite a lot of money across the length of a contract. And again, particularly where you've got split budget responsibilities for acquisition and later on maintenance and running and disposal costs. Within a tender process, it tends to come in two places. One's the planning element of it, and one's the tender evaluation element. I mentioned the needs analysis, so looking at the real cost of alternative options. If you think you have two or three ways you want forward, you can actually use life cycle costing to actually work that way through it, which means you get the scope better defined. You've worked it through to begin with. It's not kind of reiterating and redrafting stuff. Feeds into a needs assessment very, very neatly. And also, if you look at the market engagement element of it, speak to the market. They may well have done this before, in which case they know what's coming up and can actually help you in the process. And again, if you know your, your organization's priorities, life cycle costing can help you get the most um, beneficial, optimal way forward on this. Then with the tender valuation itself, you can compare life cycle costing on, on bids. It's like for like. You've given the, the bidders the methodology you want to use. It's a much easier process than actually trying to pull information from other places. Within tendering, if you are going to use life cycle costing, some conditions are actually mandatory, which actually makes sense, and the, most of the time it falls in with the, the, the kind of ethos and behind the procurement directors. It, all the criteria you move, use must be objectively verifiable. You can't, it can't be subject to going, I think it's this, so we'll just put that figure in, and it must be non-discriminatory. And to that end, it must be accessible by all parties, which means it can't be too complex that only the really big organisations can, can um, actually do the life cycle costing element. Small organisations are tight on resources, and I mean human resources on this, and it does take time to do. So make it accessible, don't make it over complex, because if you make it over complex, then actually you're going to have problems later on your own evaluation models. Don't ask for too much information, only ask what you need for. Again, in procurement that should be logical, but some people go over the top as a just-in-case basis. And again, if there are any mandatory, mandatory methods and methodologies, use them. But as I say at the moment, there's only the clean vehicle directors one. There's various methodologies that exist, and they are publicly available. Have a look on the SPP and ICLEI sites for more information. They have a lot of information on there, and particularly around them at their best practice reports. Great information on that. You can devise your own, but make sure that it's transparent. All bidders can request information, and you as an organisation can actually ass uh, assess and verify what you're actually asking for. If you don't have the ability to do that, and you're not sure exactly what you want and how you want it, then how on earth is a bidder or tender going to be able to do it as well? People put up lots of barriers to life cycle costing. Primarily, it's kind of, it was always a construction industry, why are we doing it? Lack of expertise, which is true. Not that many people know how to do it, but it's not a barrier, you can always learn. There's too many tools out there, which one do I use? Doesn't matter, have a look at two or three and see which one fits you better, adapt if necessary. You haven't planned enough time into the procurement process, and that's possibly the most frequent one. Looking at the top down, you haven't thought, right, we want to do this properly, how are we going to do it? Lack of awareness, oh, I didn't know we could do it, or something like that. We don't know what's available and where it's around. Honestly, ask your peers and ask internal and external. There is stuff available. You just don't care. You're too rushed. You've got too many contracts to deal with. You just don't care to get to that stage. And the last one, it takes too long to do. Yes, it is a process, but it can make the process much faster. It can speed up your needs analysis, and actually it can definitely speed up your evaluation as well. But also, it means that there's less clarification from people on your evaluation panel because everyone's working to the same methodology. Mitigation of those barriers. Don't reinvent the wheel. All the information's out there. There will be more, and it'll everything get superseded, but have a look, don't reinvent it. Peer learning, internal and external. There's lots of networks and four of these days. Have a look at them. Experience, do it. 
The more expensive you have in doing life cycle costing, the easier it becomes. You can become the expert that other people want to learn from. Engage other teams. Absolutely essential, particularly with a split resp budget responsibility. Make sure you engage. Someone else will know something useful somewhere. And talk to the market early. Honestly, do, because quite often they know more than you think they do. They might have done life cycle costing before, and if, they, if it's going to go on a tender process, then actually they need to know that's the way forward as well. Thank you. That's the end of this module. I hope it is just a whistle-stop tour. There's lots more information out there, so please do have a look at it on the SPP Regions websites.